Hello and welcome to this PodMedics podcast on diseases of the prostate. My name is Nitin Lamba and I am a medical student at the University of Aberdeen. In this podcast I will briefly discuss the relevant anatomy of the prostate gland, then I will talk about two of the common conditions affecting the prostate, namely benign prostatic hypertrophy and prostate cancer. So firstly the anatomy of the prostate gland. The prostate gland lies directly below the neck of the bladder and therefore the first three centimeters of the male urethra lies within the center of the prostate gland. Therefore, as will be discussed later in this podcast, enlargement of the prostate can lead to urethral obstruction. The posterior part of the prostate gland can be palpated by digital rectal examination. A median groove which divides the prostate into two lateral lobes is usually palpable. However, this is not the case if there is advanced prostatic malignancy. There is also a median lobe which is actually in the posterior part of the gland, above the opening of the two ejaculatory ducts that emerge from the ductus deferens. The prostate consists of three zones which can be seen in the diagram on the top right of this slide. These are the central zone, the transition zone, and the peripheral zone. It is enlargement of the transition zone that leads to benign prostatic hypertrophy, whilst prostate malignancies tend to occur in the peripheral zone. The prostate gland is supplied by prostatic branches of the internal iliac arteries, whilst veins from the gland drain into the prostatic venous plexus, which in turn drain into the internal vertebral venous plexus. This communication can be clinically significant, as it is a potential route of spread of infection or malignant cells to the sacral vertebrae. Lymph from the prostate gland mainly drains into the internal iliac nodes, although some does drain into the sacral lymph nodes. The main function of the prostate gland is to secrete an alkaline prostatic fluid that forms approximately 20-30% to of seminal fluid. These secretions are needed to ensure normal sperm function and fertility. I will now go on to discuss benign prostatic hypertrophy. This is a common condition with nearly half of all men being affected at some stage in their lives. Incidence of benign prostatic hypertrophy or BPH increases with age. However, only 40 to 50% of men with BPH develop any symptoms. In terms of pathophysiology, there is nodular hyperplasia of the transition zone of the prostate gland. Given the anatomical proximity of the transition zone to the prostatic urethra, it is not surprising that there is constriction of the urethra in this area. This leads to bladder outlet obstruction. As well as causing the clinical features that will be described on the next slide, bladder outlet obstruction will cause urinary retention, leading to hydronephrosis. It will also cause a urinary tract infection due to urinary stasis. Overflow incontinence will also occur due to a reduced tone of the bladder. The clinical features of BPH, also known as lower urinary tract symptoms, can be divided into those due to storage issues and those due to voiding issues. Storage-related symptoms are frequency, urgency, and nocturia. Voiding-related symptoms include intermittent flow, weak stream, hesitancy, terminal dribbling, and straining to initiate micturition. There can also be a sense of incomplete voiding and prolonged voiding. The International Prostate Symptom Score, or IPSS, can be used to formally assess the severity of symptoms using many of the symptoms already described. However, lower urinary tract symptoms are not unique to BPH and can occur with other conditions, such as urethral stricture, prostate cancer, and the use of anticholinergic agents that can inhibit the activity of the detrusor muscle. Investigations for suspected BPH should include a midstream sample of urine for microscopy and culture, since a UTI may be a differential diagnosis, as well as a potential complication of the urinary retention resulting from BPH. 
the rate of urine flow should also be quantitatively measured. Blood tests to be carried out include use and ease to assess renal function and serum PSA if prostate cancer is suspected. A renal ultrasound should also be carried out to estimate the volume of residual urine present. The only way to accurately assess the anatomy of a bladder outflow obstruction is with a cystoscopy, and so this should be also carried out as part of the investigations. If there is a raised PSA and the prostate feels nodular on palpation via a rectal examination, then a transrectal ultrasound-guided needle biopsy should be carried out, as these features raise the suspicion of prostate cancer. Treatment of BPH is very much dependent on the presence and severity of symptoms that the patient is experiencing. If these are tolerable for the patient, then treatment can be conservative. However, active treatment can be divided into medical and surgical modalities. Medical treatment involves the use of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, such as finasteride, and alpha-1 adrenergic blockers, such as tamsulosin. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors act by inhibiting the enzyme that converts testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, which is required by the prostate for continued hyperplasia. Therefore, failure to produce dihydrotestosterone will lead to a decrease in the size of the prostate gland. However, these drugs can take up to six months to be effective. In contrast, alpha-1 adrenergic blockers act selectively by reducing the smooth muscle tone of the prostate and the neck of the bladder, leading to reduced resistance to micturison and relief of symptoms. These effects tend to be more immediate, and so alpha-1 blockers and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors can be thought of in the same way as salbutamol and steroid inhalers in the treatment of asthma, in that one is a preventer and one is a reliever of symptoms. Failure of medical treatment often requires the need for surgical intervention, with the gold standard treatment being transurethral resection of the prostate. Although this procedure has a relatively low mortality rate and a short hospital stay, there are several side effects, including erectile dysfunction, retrograde ejaculation, and urethral strictures. I will now move on to discuss prostate cancer. So this is the second most common malignancy in men. Although the etiology is not well known, there are increased risks associated with increasing age, ethnicity, and previous family history of prostate cancer. It is rare for prostate cancer to be present in, the me in men under the age of 50 years, but is more common in men over the age of 80 years. Prostate cancer usually arises in the peripheral zone of the prostate gland, away from the area closest to the urethra. Therefore, urinary symptoms may not develop until there is significant extension of the tumour. Malignant prostate tumours are usually adenocarcinomas. The symptoms of prostate cancer can often be difficult to distinguish from those of BPH and may only be diagnosed by histological analysis following a transurethral resection of the prostate. Prostate tumours can be staged using the TNM classification. T1 tumours are not palpable on digital rectal examination whereas T2 tumours are those that are confined within the capsule of the prostate gland. Tumours that extend beyond the capsule of the prostate gland are classed as T3 tumours, whilst T4 tumours are those that are fixed to neighbouring structures. T3 and T4 tumours are more likely to have metastasized to the pelvic lymph nodes and or via hematogenous spread to the pelvis and vertebral column. Clinical features of prostate cancer are dependent on the size of the primary tumour and the amount of any systemic spread. T1 and T2 tumours can be asymptomatic, being found incidentally on a routine health check. However, these tumours can also present with lower urinary tract symptoms, such as those that were previously described for BPH. These tumours, unlike T3 and T4 tumours, are unlikely to have associated metastases. T1 
T3 and T4 tumors can also present with lower urinary tract symptoms, but may also present with other symptoms as a result of local advancement of the tumor. These can include urinary incontinence, renal failure. Um, this is due to the involvement of the bladder neck and occlusion of the ureters. Other symptoms can be altered bowel habit due to the involvement of the rectum. Since T3 and T4 tumours are likely to have associated metastases, they will also have features related to the site of metastasis, such as back pain, pathological fractures and spinal cord compression. The tumour can then spread into the pelvic lymph nodes or hematogenously into the pelvis and spinal column. If there is meta metastatic spread, the average survival time from diagnosis is approximately two years. Following a digital rectal examination, a urinary flow measurement is carried out. Use and ease are carried out to assess renal function, while serum calcium levels may be affected if there are bony metastases present. These may also be detected with plain radiographs of the pelvis and lower spine. Prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, is a glycoprotein that is secreted by prostate tumours and can be measured with a blood test. The amount that is secreted is dependent on how much the tumour has advanced. PSA, however, is not a specific biomarker for prostate cancer as it can rise in response to BPH, prostatitis, and a urinary tract infection. However, a significant rise in the level of PSA is more likely to be due to prostate cancer. Confirmation of prostate cancer is achieved by carrying out a transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy. Once the diagnosis of prostate cancer has been confirmed, staging of the tumour needs to be carried out. And this is done by using an MRI of the abdomen and pelvis. Histological analysis of the biopsy is used to determine the grading of the malignancy, which is important in predicting the prognosis for the patient. The tumour is graded using the Gleason scoring system, where a low-grade, well-differentiated tumour is given a low score and a high-grade, poorly differentiated tumour is given a high score. This score is given to the primary grade and to the secondary grade, with each of the two grades being given a score of between 1 and 5, resulting in an overall score from 2 to 10. The primary grade is essentially the most dominant pattern of the tumour, whilst the secondary grade is the next most common pattern of the tumour. In terms of prognostic factors for prostate cancer, the level of PSA present in blood uh, prior to treatment is an important prognostic factor, as is the TNM stage and the Gleason score. Management of prostate cancer is dependent on the stage of the tumour. Where there is a T1 or T2 tumour, this is known as early stage disease, since the disease is confined to within the capsule of the prostate gland. Treatment can be potentially curative, with options for treatment including radical prostatectomy or brachytherapy. However, factors such as the level of disease activity which can be detected by changes in PSA levels and palpation of the gland by digital rectal examination, as well as patient comorbidities, need to be considered before deciding upon treatment at this stage, where active monitoring may also be a treatment option. Androgens, such as testosterone, cause an increase in the size of prostate malignancies. Therefore, in T3 and T4 tumours, known as locally advanced disease, and in metastatic disease, treatment is based around reducing the amount of androgens to which the tumour is exposed. This can be achieved either via medical castration or surgical castration. Medical castration involves the use of LH-RH agonists, such as gosarin 
which initially cause an increase in testosterone levels. However, after two weeks of treatment, there is downregulation of pituitary receptors, leading to a reduction in testosterone levels, and therefore, theoretically, a decrease in the size of the prostate tumour. To counter the initial increase in testosterone levels in the first two weeks of treatment with LHRH agonists, Patients are also given a short course of anti-androgen medication. Testosterone levels also decrease with a surgical orchidectomy, but this occurs relatively immediately after surgery. However, the decrease in testosterone will have some side effects, including hot flushes, low mood, sexual dysfunction, loss of libido, and gynecomastia. So to summarise, I have looked at the anatomy of the prostate gland, as well as the etiology, clinical features, investigations and treatment, firstly of BPH and then of prostate cancer. Thank you for listening.